In this video, we are going to do a guide on simple linear regression. So let's go ahead and start off with our intro. So Megan is working with NASA to monitor a rover that has recently landed on Mars. Her job is to track the weather to determine when they should deploy shields over the rover's sensors. Unfortunately, if she puts the shields up, they are unable to perform the mission experiments. But if she leaves them down during intense dust storms, the sensors will be permanently damaged. Uh, her main concern is about the amount of particles in the atmosphere during the dust storms. Instead of sitting up all the time with her finger hovering over the shield now button, it would be too late anyways to protect the sensors due to the time it would take to send a signal, she thought it would be way better to just send, uh, set up an algorithm uh, to tell the rover when to shut down itself. Measuring wind speed is one of the few sensors that is always safe to have running. As such, she wants to be able to predict the amount of particulates in the air based on the wind speed. So she starts taking measurements and wants to see if there is a relationship between airspeed and the number of particulates uh, in the air. She tests at the significance level of 0 0.03. And note the measurements are the number of particulates per cubic centimeter and kilometers per hour. So before we do anything, let's just go ahead and grab our data. We will copy it. And let's put it into our commander. Okay, and if we look at our data set, let's view it. And if we go all the way to the bottom, we've got 23.6. Let's just make sure that's what it came to, 23.6. Okay, we look good. Okay, so let's now go ahead and do our preliminary questions. So the first question is, is what type of data are we dealing with? Now, if we look at our data again, we see that we have numerical in both of our uh, columns. And so this is going to be what's called numerical by numerical. The predictor variable of interest is what are we going to measure to try to figure out what the response is. And so we're going to use the wind speed as our predictor. And the response then is going to be the particulates in the air. The population of interest is a little interesting here. It's going to be the atmospheric conditions near the rover. We're not interested in water content or even the rover status, but we're interested in these atmospheric conditions near the rover. And then the parameter of interest is going to be the true mean particles per cubic centimeter. Okay, now we need to go and do some checks on our uh, simple linear regression. We should actually probably answer this guy. Which method should we be using for analysis first? We want to be using a regression analysis. Okay, so in order to get this plot, we first need to perform our regression model. So we're going to go down to statistics, fit models, linear regression, and then we just need to pick out the response and the explanatory variable. So the response is going to be our particulates, and then the wind speed is going to be our explanatory, and then we just go ahead and click OK. And so we get this output, and we're actually we're going to ignore it right now. Next thing that we're going to do is go to models, uh, graphs, and basic diagnostic plots. When we do that, we get this graphic. <clears throat> And it's these two that we're interested in. Now, so from previous videos, we've learned that with our residuals, we are interested in these five things. And if we have a problem, a serious problem with any one of them, we probably shouldn't do our regression analysis or this simple linear regression analysis. Okay, so remember, these residuals represent how much error there is from our model to the actual points that we observed. So, you know, before we do this, let's actually build a scatter plot real quick so that we can actually see what's going on. So we've got our scatter plot. X is going to be the wind speed. <clears throat> y is going to be our particulates. And for the X label, we can do just wind speed. Y will have particulates graph and we'll say rover uh, rover conditions and we want to include this least squares line this is the line that actually is made when we perform our simple linear regression okay and let's go ahead and click okay and here we go so these are the measurements that we took and this is the line of best fit so what these residuals represent is the distance from an individual measurement to the line. That's the error that our model had in actually predicting what's going on. And so we have some requirements with what our residuals need to be. So let's go ahead and get that basic diagnostics again. 
And here we go. <clears throat> so the first thing that we're looking for is linearity. So is do we see any major patterns? Like do you see like some sinusoid? Do we see like a line slanting down? Do we see a parabola? If we were to see something like that, then we'd have some serious issues with linearity. But since we don't, we're going to just leave it alone. Next one, constant variance. This is where are we seeing like some major fanning? Where are the points really clustered together and then do they spread further out as we go along now if we look at this we're actually pretty good now somebody might say well what about this 15 it looks like kind of we're spreading out well kind of the rule of thumb is that if you are to cover up like a single point or maybe two or even three points and that pattern all of a sudden disappears uh, you're not seeing a pattern then what you're seeing is just you know some random points that are making it look like that you're seeing a pattern it needs to be a systematic problem um, where it is evident even when you cover up a couple of outlying points. Independence next. So this is clustering and clumping. Now, whenever we do uh, these regression analysis, you're going to see some little clumps uh, of points together, and that's okay. But the problem is, is if we have a, t a huge amount of clump and then this big empty space, and then a huge clump and then a big empty space, that's where we run into problems. Here, we don't see that, so we've got good for our independence. Next, centered about zero. Now, I when we run this in the R Commander, uh, it's what it actually does is it centers this thing about zero. It's what it does. So this one really is just like a check if you were doing this stuff by hand to make sure that it's centered about zero. Ours is centered about zero. Next one is normal. So about this zero line, most of the points should be clustered pretty close to the zero line. And then as you get further and further away from the zero line, we're going to have fewer and fewer points. That's one way to check it for normality. The other way that we can check for normality is look at this normal QQ. This is very similar to what we did in our ANOVA testing as well. And as long as these points are really close to the line, or we're kind of plotting these our error terms against what we think we should see, and we can see that we're really close to what the theoretical is supposed to be. So we have no problems with normality either. So overall, we are doing really well with our residual requirements. So it looks like that we are good to go for our regression analysis. And the distribution that we should be using is the F. You can also do it with the T distribution, but we're going to go ahead and stick with the F. Okay, <clears throat> coming on down. We need to establish our null and all in our alternative hypothesis. And what we're testing against now isn't the mean or the per true proportion, but it's the true slope instead. And just as always, it's going to be equals to, and the value is zero. So if the slope is zero, it means that there is no relationship between these two variables. Let's go ahead and grab that scatter plot again. So it would be if there's a flat line. And what we say is if we go back and look up in here, we said that so she starts taking measurements and want to see if there is a relationship. Now, she doesn't specify if she thinks it's a positive or a negative relationship. So we're going to do not equals to and still zero. OK, next is we need to click on which scatter plot does this thing actually most look like. And so when we do this, we want to click on this guy. This is the one that actually matches up with what we're doing. Okay, now the relationship. We actually on this one have a positive relationship. As our wind speed increases, what our data suggests is that the number of particulates in the air increases as well too. So we want to go ahead and click on positive. If it was negative, it's going now. These other two are just kind of things to throw you off. Uh, the Relationships are either going to be positive, negative, or I guess we could also say that there is no relationship. Okay, so if we identify alpha, that is, was given to us right up here, 0 0.03, so we can just copy that guy and paste it in here. And now we're interested in, so B0 is the sample intercept and B1 is the sample slope. We can get those from our regression output. So. Let's see our regression output. I'm going to highlight it. This right here highlighted is our regression output. The residuals here, this is like a five number summary on our residuals, but we've already kind of taken a look at our residuals when we looked at the residual plots. So we're really interested in, in our coefficients. Okay, the intercept, this is our B naught. I'm just going to copy that guy. I'm going to paste it. 
And then b1 is this estimate on the wind, the coefficient estimate for the wind speed. And I can paste it there. r squared is this multiple r squared. So I'm going to copy this guy and I'm going to paste it in there. And then our f is going to be this 26. And I can paste it in. And our p-value, now where do we grab the p-value? Our p-value can come from one of two places, and it's going to be the same value. So if we grab it from the f-statistic, it's right here with our p-value. If you grab it with the t-statistic, it's right here next to the wind speed, but it's the same one either way. Okay, so what we can do is I'm just going to go ahead and copy this guy, and I'm going to paste it in with our p-value. Okay, so our p-value is less than alpha, and so I'm going to skip the confidence interval just for a second, and we would then reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so our confidence interval is about b1, and if we want to do that, there is, we have some options. Give me just a second. Okay, so we could do it by hand. If we wanted to do it by hand, we could grab the estimate of the wind speed. We could grab that guy, and we can paste it there. And it would be this uh, plus or minus, and then we'd need a t, score, or t critical multiplied by the standard error. And the nice thing is, is they give us the standard error right here. We can copy this standard error and paste it down here. So that's how we could do the confidence interval by hand, and we could go grab this t-critical. Let's just go ahead and do it real quick, and just so that we can remember how to do it. Now remember, when we're doing our t-critical, we need a couple things. We need to know what alpha is, and our alpha level was 0 0.3, and we need to know how many degrees of freedom we have on the residuals in this case, and it would be the 27 degrees of freedom. So I'm going to copy that 27, and I'm going to go to my basic statistics, my random variables, continuous, and looking for this t. We use the t distribution when we're doing our confidence intervals for our slope. And we can go to the t quantiles. And what we need to put in here is 0 0.015, comma 0 0.985. And that's because I'm doing 1.5 at the bottom and 1.5 at the top because we are doing a two-tailed interval. And I'll just click on this lower tail, and I'll click OK. And it gives me these as my t criticals. And they're the same because, once again, this is, remember, the t distribution is symmetric. We're going the same distance above and below since this is two-tailed. So I'm just going to copy this guy and put it into, oops, where I have my t crit. And so first I'm going to start on the minus, and then I'll do the same thing with the plus. And there's my confidence interval, so I, uh, where this is where I think that the true slope is located. Okay, from here, there's actually a way easier way to do what we just did. We can also just go to models, and we can get a confidence intervals on that model. And we can set the confidence level at 97, and if I click OK, check this out. I get this 0.261821. It's exactly what I did there. And this 0.68467. So there's two ways that you can do the confidence interval. I would probably just do it with this guy because it's way easier. Now, just on a side note, suppose that we had done a one-tailed confidence interval uh, where we had done, um, oh, like we had done a greater than or a less than in our uh, alternative or in our alternative hypothesis. There's a couple things that, that we'd have to uh, edit there. So one thing first, if you're doing a one-tailed test, whatever the p-value is, you're going to have to divide it by two uh, because the p-values here are assuming that we are doing a two-tailed interval. If we're doing a one-tail, you just need to divide the p-value by two. The other thing that we have to remember is that here, these are always doing two-tail intervals. So if we wanted to do a one-tail interval, you can double the p-value, or you can double the, sorry, alpha level, and then it will let you know uh, if you were going to be a greater than or less than. Let, let me show you what exactly I mean. So if we go back to our base for our models, and we did a confidence interval, 
And so the, our alpha level is 0.3, but if I go to alpha of um, 0 0.6 uh, and I click OK, bear with me, this would be if I was doing a greater than, I could do, uh, you know, I'm 97% or what would this be? Yeah, 97% confident that we're greater than this 0.292 or 97% confident that I'm less than this 0.6544. Um, I'll probably post another video to show exactly how we can do that, but just know that you can use this, even though that it's set up to just do two tailed intervals, that you can um, tweak with the alpha level so that you can figure out what the one tail uh, bounds are as well. Okay, enough of that. Let's go ahead and input in our confidence levels. So we're doing these guys. Okay, so now we're down here with our conclusion. So we have collected sufficient evidence and we have this F1 and 27. You're like, where did that one and that 27 come from? Well, what it comes from is it comes from this part of our output, F statistic 26 on one and 27 degrees of freedom. We need both of those for the APA uh, reporting format. And then you put in this 26.295 because that's what we've got here with this specific p-value and the alpha level. Okay, so we've collected sufficient evidence to reject the claim that there is no relationship between the wind speed and number of particulates in the air, and said claim that there is a relationship between the two. Our model is able to account for 49, per, uh, like 49 percent of the variability in the data, which is a poor model. And we could actually see that from our Scatter plot. Notice how far away the points are from the line. There's a lot more going on than just the wind speed. Um, there might be other factors, maybe also the, the temperature is outside. Maybe that has something to do with how many particulates get into the air. Um, but there's a lot of variability going on. So it's, it is a significant, uh, result, but it's just not a very good model. So we, in, if we were doing this in the real world, we'd want to account for and control for other factors as well. Okay, so we are 97% confident that for every one kilometer per hour increase in the wind speed, the true mean number of particulates per cubic centimeter increases by somewhere between 0.2618 and 0.6847. So remember that's that the slope, that the true slope, remember the slope is define once again that is for every one unit increase in x y increases by whatever the slope is and we think that the true slope is somewhere between these two guys or we're 97 percent confident that the true slope is somewhere between those two and let's go ahead and submit and see how we did and if we go through it looks like that we nailed it. So that is how you do a simple linear regression uh, with that numerical by numerical data. So good luck uh, using this guide and doing other simple linear regressions.